the Open Book website. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4 and follow the links to Open Book. And there you will also find details of all the other books that were mentioned on today's programme. In 1943, a group of soldier poets compiled an anthology of poems that told of their experiences fighting in the desert. It was called the Oasis Anthology, and we'll be hearing some of its contents in a moment. This is Kirsty Young from BBC Radio 4, in the gym with Kamal. Tom Service from BBC Radio 3 with Rachel on the way to the shops. Take BBC Radio with you, whenever and wherever you go, with BBC iPlayer Radio. This is Joe Wiley from Radio 2, in the garden with Ian. You can listen live, or catch up on your computer, tablet or mobile, or download the brand new app. To start your BBC iPlayer Radio journey, go to the Radio 4 website. Well, this week marks the 70th anniversary of the turning point of the campaign in the Western Desert during World War II. In Return to Oasis now, Mike Greenwood reports from El Alamein in Egypt about how the experiences of the men and women who fought in North Africa were captured in poetry. Right, this is Mitterrey Ridge. Monty's plan was to go his men on the horizon. By on a spur of rock overlooking a landscape of flat, stony sand and thorn bushes, people have come to remember the past 70 years ago. This was the main killing ground for the first couple of three days at El Alamein. Charles was here. Yes, yeah. I remember the barrage starting up. 700 guns going all the time, as fast as they could. Bang, bang, bang. The ground was shaking and, and everything was bang, 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 bang. And you thought, well, nobody could survive that the other end. But after the, the barrage stopped, they started firing back at us. You up there, Charles. Is this some 40s? Come on. Oh, which, which side? The good side? Show the side you show Rommel the front. Here at the battlefield of El Alamein, veterans have come to remember lost friends. We were here with the Italian veteran paratrooper and uh, we searched for his own uh, foxhole. It was a, a gunner indeed, and we found it. He recognized every trench close to his own one. Then he stopped, he looked behind him, searching for his crew, and it was uh, amazing. People have come to pay tribute to relations perhaps they never even knew. My father was killed here. He was with the Queen's own Robert Kent. and was killed by a shell. I was born a very short while after he was killed. So we're coming over to visit the 70th anniversary to um, visit the grave. What do you feel uh, now that you're here? Uh, emotional. <laughs> hard to comprehend how young men from England, from the countryside, have found themselves out here. I've come to explore how the experiences of the men and women who fought in the Western Desert in World War II were expressed in poetry, and in particular one collection of poetry, the Oasis Poems, which became the nucleus of a remarkable body of war poetry that captured the experiences of a generation. There are flowers now, they say, at El Alamein. Yes, Flowers in the minefields now, so that those who come to view that vacant scene where death remains and agony has been will find the lilies grow. Flowers, and nothing that we know. As the dictionary has it, oasis, a fertile spot in a sandy desert, any place of rest or pleasure in the midst of toil. In October and November 1942, this place was anything but peaceful. For a very long period, there wasn't a single second when not one gun, but many were blazing away. With all that and the still brilliant moon, there wasn't much darkness in this part of the desert. Night Barrage, Western Desert, by W.G. Holloway. The cannon's bloodshot eyes blinked out their murderous message through the night and the soaring very lights climbed up to peer at spectator stars and the thump of guns found fearful echo in the frenzied beating of the heart. I've often felt that the poetry of World War II has been unfairly eclipsed by that of the First World War. But this was an army in North Africa that cared about words Penguin paperbacks travelled in kit bags. Some men wrote verse. The Eighth Army held poetry competitions. 
I think what the best poetry of the Desert Campaign captures is the suffering, the humour, the hope and dreams of a citizen army who'd seen what their fathers had gone through and still endured. It's a great shame that we don't read the Second World War poets more, partly because I think their experience and what they have to say is much, much closer to our contemporary lives now and our contemporary conflicts, and so they still have something to say very much to us now. The poet and playwright Owen Shears is drawn to the poetry of the Desert Campaign, out of which rose great poetic voices like Keith Douglas and poets of huge potential like Sidney Keyes, killed in Tunisia in 1943, just before his 21st birthday. War poet. I am the man who looked for peace and found my own eyes barbed. I am the man who groped for words and found an arrow in my hand. I am the builder whose firm walls surround a slipping land. When I grow sick or mad, mock me not nor chain me. When I reach for the wind, cast me not down, though my face is a burnt book and a wasted town. This was a generation which was incredibly well educated and you feel this in the poetry. They were an aware generation. And I feel as though if there is a general voice to the Second World War, it certainly is a very plain speaking voice. It's a determination you know, to not mess about and to say, look, we need to look this straight in the eye. Uh, this is how it was. Even in the modern city, straining at its concrete seams, it's still possible to imagine what a culture shock that first encounter with Cairo was for men who'd arrived with white knees after a long voyage around the Cape. What one writer called the hot, dusty, pagan smell of Cairo, a mix of strangeness, exoticism and decadence, caught by Keith Douglas in the poem Cairo Jag, Shall I get drunk or cut myself a piece of cake? A pale Syrian with a few words of English. Or the Turk who says she's a princess. She dances by apparent levitation. Or Marcel, Parisienne, always preoccupied with her dead, dull lover. All this takes place in a stink of jasmine. But by a day's travelling, you reach a new world. The vegetation is of iron. Dead tanks and gun barrels split like celery. The metal brambles without flowers or berries. And there are all sorts of manure, you can imagine. The dead themselves, their boots, clothes and possessions clinging to the ground. A man with no head has a packet of chocolate and a souvenir of Tripoli. At the Music for All Social Club in Cairo, three servicemen, Dennis Saunders from South Africa, David Burke and Victor Selwyn, had the idea of publishing poems that would convey the experiences and feelings of ordinary men and women serving in North Africa. Thousands of poems were submitted. The result? A thin volume, Oasis, published in Cairo by the Salamander Society. 5,000 copies sold out immediately. Back in 1942, it was a gesture of creative audacity by three poetry lovers, none ranking higher than Corporal. We're hearing poems from that original collection and from a later anthology, Return to Oasis, which brought together the original poems with previously published work by writers like Keith Douglas and a whole new trove of unpublished poetry written by the troops during the long campaign against Rommel. Major General Julian Thompson is a military historian and author of Forgotten Voices, Desert Victory. Tanks were motoring around, rather like ships at sea, in this open terrain. You were fighting in an area where there wasn't any population. It was empty. And of course this meant that you didn't get the destruction of towns and villages as you'd seen on the Western Front in France. But I think it's also wrong to imagine it as a wonderful sort of romantic buccaneering type of warfare where no one got hurt because people did get hurt and, and there were some huge casualties in the fighting in the desert. The enemy common to both sides was the environment, the landscape, the desert. Well, the, the environment, of course, is everything. And, and, of course, the desert meant that you got sandstorms, you got dust everywhere. Every time you drove a vehicle, a great plume of dust uh, came out of the back and you were covered in grime. 
water was short, therefore you couldn't bath and wash as often as you like. People actually used to use petrol to wash their clothes in because petrol was more available than water. And just imagine doing that. Desert Madness by Leslie Howe Have you ever seen a locust on the desert breeze? Have you ever had a scorpion crawling on your knees? Have you ever watched black beetles rolling balls of dirt? Have you ever caught a sand louse exploring in your shirt? You should see the wretched sandstorms that come in from the dunes when the wind screams round our lorries playing funny tunes and the sand gets in our food, our clothes, our eyes and hair, through our kit bags, in our packs, in fact, just everywhere. Len Burritt served as a signaller in the desert right from the start with the 7th Armoured Division, the original Desert Rats. We used to fight during the day. The B echelon would come up to us at night and bring the cookhouse, the petrol and the ammunition up for the next lot of fighting and so on. I mean, sometimes we used to advance 120 miles. Sometimes our cookhouse never reached us, so... We used to go out, dive into the, well, our main ration was bully beef and biscuits. Uh, the worst thing for us were the flies, virtually. When people sit down on the sand in the desert for a week or so, thousands and thousands of flies concentrate. And then the CO toddles round, pack up boys, look slick, and all our stuff is on those trucks, you bet, in half a tick, because Jerry's just along the ridge. We will give him hell, though tyres be flat. For in the loads, a tonne of sand as well. What were these soldier poets of North Africa fighting and writing for? Dennis Healy served in Tunisia and then in Italy with the 8th Army. Most of the poets who fought in the First World War thought it should never have happened. And uh, that they, they were dying for simply the stupidity of the politicians who ran their country Whereas we felt quite differently in the Second World War because the one thing we didn't want is for Hitler to, to run Europe and then probably invade Britain, so that we thought it was well worth fighting the Second World War. For Healy, the value of the Oasis poems is that they capture the authentic voices of war. Well, it was ordinary people writing, that was the real point. Not They didn't think of themselves particularly as working class. But uh, they certainly weren't toffs and they didn't feel like toffs. What had happened then to, to give ordinary people a voice? Well, obviously for ordinary people the experience of war was uh, mind-shattering, but it was also personality changing. And people who f fought in the war had a different feeling about things at the end of it. You're talking about an army which is more informed, used to listening to the wireless. They know what's going on the sort of deferential attitudes that were brought into the First World War army because it was a Victorian army, because it had all been born in the reign of Victoria, had gone. They were far more cynical. There wasn't a, a sort of, oh, well, sir is always right stuff. They were more questioning. And so it was a different army, one that answered back. A persistent presence in the poetry is the desert itself, up the blue, as the soldiers called it, a horizon of haze and mirage at midday, a palette of colours from mauve to grey to orange at sunset. A haunting, seemingly empty, alien landscape that could just as suddenly be full of struggling men and burning tanks. Imagine being in a desert, flat desert sand, at night, us chaps waiting to go into action. Albert Pond commanded a tank at El Alamein and to break in the monotony and stop thinking about what the hell was going to happen next day. Some of the chaps used to sit outside in front of the tank, and these, these chaps used to write poems. Save you from going mad, I think. That was to take our mind off the horrors of war. Before El Alamein by Ronald E. B. Dull quiet and sand hills and a pallid moon a little young moon in a cloudy drift small matter for a poem i shall soon be old for rhyming wonder's a child's gift and this is no child's world the sand is mined plains wander like the ghosts of men who died without absolving priest my easier mind finds pleasure wandering but is close tied to this steel coffin all due service said 
quietness but for a cricket scrape and the far sound of gossip before bed. A dust plume travels on the distant shape of hills where tanks are leaguered without sound. So, in far sand, be all day's echoes drowned. Now, my forecast of this battle is that there will be three definite stages. First, the break-in to the enemy's positions, then the dogfight, and then the break-out. I believe that the dogfight battle will become a hard killing match. It was, as Field Marshal Montgomery promised, a bloody affair. We opened up with, what, almost a thousand guns on the 23 or 4 mile front line. It turned night into day virtually and went on for quite a while. Well, it was like being in a meteorite storm, really. I mean, it just wasn't the sound, it was shaking. The actual battle of Alamein on the 23rd of October 1942, that will live for me until my last days because that was hell on earth. I seen men hanging out the sides of the tanks, dead. Tanks on fire, men screaming. People who's lived a normal life and then plunged into that sort of atmosphere of war, all them times we went into battle and came on out again and into battle again, I used to pray for the time, some of us did, to get it, to get out of it. Dance Grotesque by John Remington. The devil played the drums when Peter died. An overture of bombs and crashing sound. A whirling slip of splinter caught his side and deftly set his body spinning round. Alas, he missed his final curtain calls. A khaki harlequin in dance grotesque, with just a single vulture in the stalls to witness so superb an arabesque. Tell me how you came face to face with the enemy. Face to face? Well, that happened south of Bardia, actually. There was um, a sanger being built by, I could see they were Italian, by their, their topies. Um, troops, three of them. Luckily I had a revolver and they had guns. They were all going for their rifles, but I had a revolver, so I managed to get through. So you had you had to kill them? It was either them or me. Yes, yeah. So I had to do the damage. Mm. That was me. 22nd birthday. Professor Anthony Rowland of the University of Salford has made a close study of the Oasis poems. One of the things that most interests me about the Oasis material is how these World War II poets are much more interested in documenting what it means to be a soldier in terms of being a killer. One of the paradoxes of World War I poetry is that, in a sense, it sells because it's sold as a pacifist form of poetry. The ideal soldier figure in World War I is the Wilfred Owen figure in Strange Meeting, who wants the enemy to be his friend, whereas World War II poetry is much more open about soldiers as killers. One of the originators of Oasis, Almendra, was his pen name, Dennis Saunders, in the very first 1943 anthology, as a poem when he discusses and agonises about himself as a soldier, as a killer. He understands that this is fine, this is politically sanctioned, but kind of morally and ethically he's still kind of dealing with that conundrum of how he can justify it to himself. Night preceding battle. Today I killed a man. God forgive me. Tomorrow I shall sow another political corpse, or be dead myself. And strangely, I am satisfied to be a plauded killer. Holy Mary, plead my dutied sin's legality. Is there no end, reason, answer? Damn this sea! 
The flame of hell pythoning around my trigger finger insinuates coercion, and feeling bodies blooded reeds contracting dispose of humanity's humiliated feelings and know that I am ready. Christ, it's cold tonight. El Alamein was the turning point, but for many there remained the long, bloody slog through Libya, Tunisia, Sicily and Italy, only to face the bitter indignity of being regarded as a sideshow. We're the d Dodgers out in Italy, always on the vino, always on the spree. Eighth Army scroungers and their tanks, we live in Rome among the Yanks. We are the d Dodgers over here in Italy. And what of the poetry? In the years after the war, some of the original poets and editors who'd survived formed the Salamander Oasis Trust and published a series of anthologies that brought together poems from all theatres of the Second World War. Victor Selwyn, who died in 2005, was a leading light in ensuring that the poetry of ordinary people at war did not go unread and unremembered. Well, our task is to convince the literary establishment. As far as the literary establishment is concerned, we don't exist. As far as they're concerned, this poetry does not exist. That's the problem. It's been our task as a trust to collect the poetry of those who were not established poets. They wrote, no thought about posterity, and their poems have laid in desks and drawers for 40 years, and we've launched appeal after appeal for the material to come in. We've had 10,000 of them in four appeals. This is Duxford, once an RAF fighter base and now one site of the Imperial War Museum. There are iconic planes parked on the tarmac and over there there's a hurricane. It's also home to a remarkable archive of manuscripts, poems written by servicemen and women who served in the desert and in other theatres of operations during World War II. What began then with a small poetry anthology published in Cairo grew into an enormous collection of words recording the diverse experiences of war. The origins of the archive lay in a reunion of some of the original desert poets in the 1970s and an appeal they made through the pages of the popular press for unpublished poems. They came in by the sackload and I'm here to delve into that archive with Roderick Sudderby, former keeper of the Department of Documents. Let's take just a sample box here, shall we? I see, here's one. Uh, now, an old mate wrote this in 1939 to 45. Out in a place called Benghazi, where most of the fighting was done, there a British Tommy was shot down by a Messerschmitt Hun. Oh, bury me out in the desert beneath the Arabian sun. Oh, bury me out in the desert and don't say a word to my mum. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, that, that poem, I'm afraid, did not find that its way find into, in, into, in, into, return, collection, in, in, into Return to Oasis. But they did go through everything, and you can see from the little annotations on the poems sent to them that every, everything was looked at. The poems that didn't get republished as part of the selection of poems, what is their value? I mean, what, what, uh, taken as, an, as a whole, what do these poems have that, that is worth, uh, worth preserving? The reason for preserving them is much the same reason that it's important for an archive like the one in the Imperial War Museum to preserve what is perfectly ordinary as well as what is exceptional. You get a very, very wide-ranging snapshot of what people felt and did during the war. When you read many of these poems, you, you feel like you're touching a sleeve of history, and that can often be a very, very powerful sensation. Were there any poets of real merit that came in those sackloads of poems that were submitted? I suppose probably the most outstanding one from the point of view of the Trust, because it was endlessly read at subsequent poetry readings, was Wing Commander Dennis McHarry's poem, which eventually became entitled Luck. It was originally just sent to them without a title, and at the end of a letter he, he, he attached this poem and it made an absolutely immediate impact on all the, the editors involved and they simply added a title to it and called it Luck and it is now widely recognised as one of the finest poems to have emerged from the Second World War. I suppose they'll say his last thoughts were of simple things, of April back at home and a late sun on his wings or that he murmured someone's name as earth reclaimed him sheathed in flame... Oh, God, let's have no more of empty words. Lip service, ornamenting death. 
The worms don't spare the hero, nor can children feed upon resounding praises of his deed. He died who loved to live, they'll say, unselfishly so we might have today. Like hell, he fought because he had to fight. He died, that's all. It was his unlucky night. <laughs> At the war cemeteries of Alamein, people from all over the world, from Britain, Australia and New Zealand, South Africa, Poland, France, Greece, India, countries too numerous to mention, and former enemies from Italy and Germany have come to meet for possibly the last major anniversary of remembrance. The passing of 70 years since the Battle of El Alamein is a landmark at which to pause and reflect even more deeply on what this anniversary means for each of us. Die Liebe sei ungeheuchelt. Hasset das Böse, hanget dem Guten an. In der Bruderliebe seid gegeneinander herzlich. United in thankfulness, united in recognizing sacrifice and united in commitment to work for peace together. My uncle died out here and my mum's still alive and she never knew what happened to him. So myself and my two girls have come out here to go back and tell Hi, her respects. the story. It's moving, isn't it, how an event 70 years ago ripples down through time mm. so that you're here to pay tribute to a man you never knew. I grew up, it was just an uncle that had died in the war. Now he is a person, sort of thing. Somebody with a story. Here he is. That's your, that's your mate on the night? Yes, yes, yes. 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 We were both running and then down we went. What were you doing on the night, though? Mainly lifting up mines. We had to make a passage through the minefields so the tanks could get out. I'm Sapper Westcott from Cardiff. I joined the army at the Friday before the war broke out and I served uh, seven years in the army. I lost quite a few of my old mates, and it's just nice to see where they are resting. And when the last veteran has passed away, and the desert and the march of modernity have claimed the last physical reminders of the battle, Perhaps it's in the words of poems like that by John Germain, who survived the campaign only to be killed in Normandy, that the intense experiences of the Western Desert will be best remembered. There are flowers now, they say, at El Alamein. Yes, flowers in the minefields now. So that those who come to view that vacant scene where death remains and agony has been will find the lilies grow. Flowers and nothing that we know. But this is not the place that we recall. The crowded desert crossed with foaming tracks, the one blotched building lacking half a wall, the grey-faced men, sand-powered over all, the tanks, the guns, the trucks, the black, dark, smoking wrecks. So be it. None but us has known that land. El Alamein will still be only hours, and those, and those ten, ten days, days of chaos, chaos in, the sand. in the sand, others will come that cannot understand. We'll halt beside the rusty mine tree wires and find their flowers. Return to Oasis was presented by Mike Greenwood. The poetry was read by Carl Prekop and directed by Celia de Wolf. The producer was Eve Streeter and the programme was a peer production for BBC Radio 4. Well, the news is next and then afterwards File on 4 asks how value for money can be assured when private companies, motivated by profit, take over the running of public services. That's in a couple of minutes. The investigative history series Document returns to BBC Radio 4. Often a document like this challenges, if you like, the existing history and our concepts of the period by asking us to go back to the material and ask even more questions and to try and find extra material which we may not have looked for because this document was not known. The presenter is Mike Thompson. 
What, in your view, is the significance of, of these words in front of us? They alter our understanding of the origins of the Irish Civil War. Document returns tomorrow evening at 8 o'clock. BBC News at five o'clock. Intensive preparations are underway along the eastern coast of the United States as emergency services brace themselves for Hurricane Sandy.